Subcommittee on Clean Air, Climate, and Nuclear Safety to order for this important hearing on vehicle emission standards and clean vehicles. Thank you to my ranking member, Senator Ricketts, and to the chairman and ranking member of the Committee on Environment and Public Works, Senator Copper and Senator Capito, for their helpful partnership in holding this very timely hearing. It's my pleasure to welcome my um, colleagues on the subcommittee as well uh, as our three witnesses. We appreciate your willingness to appear before our subcommittee today uh, because one day after Massachusetts celebrated Patriots Day, we are here to discuss America's clean energy revolution, which is already well underway. Last week, the Environmental Protection Agency proposed historic new rules to strengthen vehicle emissions standards for cars and for trucks. And thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law, the CHIPS and the Science Act and the Inflation Reduction Act, we can be more ambitious in our standards than ever before <clears throat> because we are actively building a world in which we can meet and exceed those goals. Because of those bills, more than $135 billion will be invested to build America's electric vehicle future. We have unleashed incentives for clean cars and trucks while creating new American jobs in the process. We're putting billions of dollars towards new electric vehicles charging stations, uh, which will make clean cars an option for families across our country. We are making clean vehicles more affordable. We're making them more accessible. And we're making them here in the United States. And companies are racing to take part in this revolution, announcing over $100 billion in battery investments alone. And while we build up our electric vehicle supply chains in the United States, we need roadside assistance for the remaining gas-guzzling cars and trucks on the roads to help fight climate change, save drivers money, and protect public health. That's where the EPA has to step in. Transportation emissions make up 27% of total greenhouse gas emissions in the United States more than half of which come from light-duty vehicles, and a quarter of which comes from heavy-duty vehicles and trucks. Cars and trucks <clears throat> also produce nitrogen oxides and other toxic pollution that increases asthma and cancer rates, harming public health and disproportionately affecting black, brown, and indigenous communities. To keep moving down the road to a safer, healthier, more affordable future, we need strong greenhouse gas emission and multi-pollutant regulation for light duty and heavy duty vehicles. And we need our foot not on the gas, but on the accelerator. Those benefits are a bonanza of, um, of benefits to our climate, to drivers, and to our health. And we need to make sure they also benefit union American workers. First, EPA's proposed rule for light duty vehicles for model year 2027 through at least 2032 would reduce carbon dioxide emissions from light duty vehicles by more than half compared to existing standards. EPA estimates that the light and medium duty rule could, one, provide up to $1.6 trillion in net benefits through the lifetime of, colored, uh, of covered uh, vehicles avoid 7.3 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide over 2027 to 2055, and save drivers up to $13,000 apiece in fuel savings and maintenance costs. Additionally, the EPA projects that 60% of new light-duty vehicles sold by 2030 will be electric as a result of the proposed rule, overtaking President Biden's target for 50% of new vehicle sales to be electric by 2030. The light duty rule could be expanded upon, and I'm interested to hear from our witnesses about what they recommend, but even so, it is an incredible start. The heavy duty rule also makes progress and charts a new course for American industry, but we still need to make sure the heavy duty rule doesn't stall out our efforts to regulate other pollutants like smog and particulate matter from trucks and other big vehicles. EPA projects that its heavy duty rule <clears throat> excuse me, will avoid 1.8 billion tons of carbon dioxide emissions by 20, 2055, 
provide net benefits of up to $350 billion through 2055, provide $12 billion in reduced reliance on oil imports, and result in a 50% zero emission vehicle penetration rate for vocational vehicles. Strong <coughs> proposed regulations are critical to driving climate progress forward, but they are more doable than ever thanks to the billions in clean vehicle investments passed by Congress. As our expert witnesses will explain, the clean vehicle revolution is not in our rear view mirror. It is right in front of us. And before we hear from our witnesses, and we thank you so much for joining us today, uh, I want to turn uh, for an opening statement from our ranking member, Senator Ricketts. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As we all know, last week the EPA introduced or announced burdensome new regulations on emission requirements for American-made vehicles, including both light cars and heavy-duty trucks. These detached from reality requirements are going to have a disastrous impact on the well-being of American families, American drivers, and American businesses. Rules like this tell states like mine that the EPA in Washington, D.C. doesn't care about our quality of life and doesn't understand who we are. It restricts freedom, shrugs off the higher cost of electric vehicles while families are struggling, ignores supply chain and infrastructure challenges, and disregards a better solution like American biofuels like, uh, like ethanol. This rulemaking claims to be technology neutral while simultaneously touting on about the push towards the administrative's goal of an entirely electric vehicle America. But let's not forget the average cost of electric vehicles is around $65,000. That's about 33% or a third higher than the average cost of a car right now. And frankly, that's more than, um, the uh, more than most American households' income. And uh, in Nebraska, you're basically asking the average family to spend their entire year income on buying this car. This administration wants to take Nebraska families' entire income to do that. As far as the claims that this rule will low, lower carbon emissions, the increased cost will actually have the opposite impact because when you increase the cost of this average vehicle because you're going to drive this mandate for electric vehicles, that means new and used vehicles will become more expensive, which means people are going to hold on to them longer um, before being able to purchase a new vehicle, and that means that you're going to have more emissions. The EPA mandate also fails to address the many logistics challenges that come from a massive uh, switch to EVs, EVs and what it poses. America lacks sufficient EV charging stations to, to cover the sharp increase in demand. President Biden's own Department of Energy map in north, northern part of Nebraska shows no EV chargers on a 340-mile stretch of U.S. Highway 20 from Allen to Hay Springs. Many Nebraska communities are hundreds of miles from the nearest charging station. I hail from the beef state, and I can guarantee you that electric trucks are really not practical when you're hauling livestock. You just can't pull over on the side of the road to charge for two hours when you're hauling a truckload of cattle in 90-degree heat. It doesn't work that way. It's just not feasible. In tandem, with these rulemakings, President Biden has refused to support American energy production, going after traditional power plants, canceling uh, lease sales, and refusing to expedite permits for new construction. Instead of developing our national resources, the, his policies are increasing our reliance on foreign adversaries. An American Transportation Research Institute study found that full electrification of the U.S. vehicle fleet would utilize a large percentage of the country's current electric generation capacity. Domestic long-haul trucking would use more than 10% of the electricity generated in our country today, while an electric U.S. fleet would use more than 40%. This will cause an incredible strain on the electric grid at a time when the Biden administration is dragging its feet on permitting generation, transmission, and storage of energy of all types. While I'm all for renewable energy production, and trust me, electric cars are cool. they got great torque. They accelerate fast. That's cool stuff. This administration is brushing over the need for reliable baseload generation. Not to mention the fact that consumers paid 14.3% more for electricity last year on average than in 2021, more than double the overall 6.5% rise in prices. This is according to the Consumer Price Index data released at the beginning of this year. 
ATRI's analysis also found that tens of millions of tons of cobalt, graphite, lithium, and nickel will be needed to replace the existing U.S. fleet with battery electric vehicles, placing high demand on raw materials. For some materials, electrification of the U.S. vehicle fleet would require almost 35 years of the current global output. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, the Chinese Communist Party controls around 80% of the world's production of rare earth elements, including elements like graphite, neodymium, that are used in EVs. President Biden's own Defense Department concluded in 2021 that an over-reliance on the Chinese Communist Party creates risk of disruption and politicized trade practices, yet his EPA is moving forward with a mandate that will increase this risk. The Biden administration has also excluded liquid fuels which support jobs in rural communities across our country. In Nebraska, we produce affordable, reliable, and clean-burning ethanol and biodiesel. Renewable fuels are here and are a here and now technology proven to work in, in heavy-duty vehicles. Right here in DC, for example, the garbage and recycling trucks operate on pure biodiesel. A fuel, a fuel uh, produced from waste, fats, and oils. And just last month, a poll showed that 70% of the poll respondents support increasing the availability of E15 to help lower fuel prices and support energy independence. That same poll showed that respondents strongly oppose government mandates related to their vehicle purchase options. A bipartisan coalition of farm state centers has long worked to promote renewable fuels, a tried and true technology for which the infrastructure already exists today, lowers carbon footprints, and saves consumers money at the pump, all while supporting our communities in rural America. There are many steps that we can take to support this here and now solution, and we must adopt a fair and consistent emissions model to truly compare these fuel sources apples to apples. In short, emissions reduction technology should be consumer driven, economically viable, and operate on a level playing field for all technologies. I'm exploring options to push back on this administration's overreach. I look forward to discussing these issues with our panel of witnesses. Thank you all for attending today. I'd also like the unanimous consent to submit four letters that I have here from, uh, let's see if we can get them here. Uh, the American Truck Dealers, <clears throat> Growth Energy, Renewable Fuels Nebraska, and the Re Renewable Fuels Association. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we thank you, Senator Ricketts, and we'll now turn to our esteemed panel of witnesses, uh, and uh, we will hear from them in this order. First, we will hear from Kathy Harris. Ms. Harris is the Senior Advocate for Clean Vehicles and Fuels for the Natural Resources Defense Council. Before that, she worked as a planner for the state of Delaware addressing policies and programs to mitigate emissions in the transportation sector. Next, we will hear from Mr. Chris Harto. Mr. Harto is the senior policy analyst on transportation and energy for Consumer Reports, where he leads research on electric vehicles, fuel economy, energy efficiency, and other energy issues. He's conducted 20 years of policy research experience <clears throat> for government agencies, national laboratories, and universities, and NGOs. And finally, we'll hear from Andrew Boyle. Mr. Boyle is co-president of Boyle Transportation, based in the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and is the first vice chairman for the American Trucking Association. Mr. Boyle is a board member of the American Transportation Research Institute and a past chairman of the Trucking Association of Massachusetts, and he grew up in Natick, Massachusetts, uh, the home of Doug Flutie, amongst many other very important citizens in the history of Natick. So we thank you all so much uh, for agreeing to uh, join us today. So Ms. Harris from the NRDC, we welcome your testimony first. Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Ricketts, and esteemed members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity today to discuss the benefits of cleaner cars in the United States and the importance of the efforts by this body and other branches of the federal government in helping accelerate the transition to a clean transportation system. My name is Kathy Harris, and I am a senior advocate leading the clean cars portfolio at the Natural Resources Defense Council, or NRDC. NRDC is an international nonprofit of scientists, lawyers, and environmental specialists committed to improving public health, tackling the climate crisis, and creating more affordable, clean energy future. 
Zero emission cars and trucks provide the United States with an opportunity to ensure a win for public health and air quality, a win for consumers' pocketbooks and consumer choice, and a win for our economy and our global competitiveness. The transportation sector is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States, but is also a major contributor to nitrogen oxides, particulate matter, and other toxic pollutants. These emissions are not only detrimental to our climate and air quality, but also to human health. The vehicle tailpipe standards announced by EPA last week will play a key role in improving, improving air quality for communities across the nation, especially communities that have been historically overburdened by vehicle pollution. EPA projects that their proposed standards will reduce tailpipe emissions by 56% by 2032 from new cars, SUVs, and pickup trucks. These ambitious and achievable standards work by setting a technology-neutral emissions levels for new cars and trucks. Based on automaker commitments and investments, increasing driver demand, and the incentives from Congress, EPA projects that manufacturers will choose to reduce emissions from their fleets through increasing the number of zero emission and electric vehicles sold. Electric and zero emission vehicle technology is a key strategy for reducing pollution from the transportation sector as they release zero tailpipe emissions, improving air quality and health. Drivers also increasingly want these vehicles for these public health benefits, in addition to the lower costs of ownership of the vehicles compared to gas-powered cars. EPA estimates that strong emission standards will save the average consumer $12,000 over the lifetime of the vehicle. And the auto industry has already invested billions of dollars in the United States to support a transition to zero emission vehicles and many manufacturers have announced plans to increase electric vehicles in their offerings, in some cases completely phasing out gasoline vehicles from their lineups over the next decade. And one thing that the Biden administration and members of Congress have made clear is that American workers and communities must be able to capture the public health and economic gains associated with transitioning to electric vehicles and building a clean economy. Strong vehicle standards from the Environmental Protection Agency will play a key role in ensuring this occurs. Strong clean vehicle standards complement the historic federal investments from Congress. The Inflation Reduction Act will not only help to make new and used electric vehicles more affordable, but it also provides important incentives to increase domestic manufacturing and access to clean vehicles helping the country become more competitive globally and bringing more of these public health and workforce benefits to our shores. And the infrastructure law passed in 2021 will help to build out a robust network of over 500,000 charging stations throughout the country to help ensure that drivers will have the ability to charge their cars reliably, while tax credits under the Inflation Reduction Act will help catalyze many more charging ports being installed across the country. It is clear that clean vehicles are a win for the United States air and public health, a win for consumers, and a win for the economy. We appreciate Congress and the federal government for their leadership in supporting the transition to a clean cars and clean air future. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you today, and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Harris, very much. Next, we're going to hear again from Chris Harto from Consumer Reports. Good afternoon, Chair Rick Markey, Ranking Me Member Ricketts, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Chris Harto, and I'm a Senior Sustainability Policy Analyst at Consumer Reports. I thank the committee for inviting CR to testify today in support of the proposed EPA greenhouse gas standards for model years 2027 through 2032 and on the benefits that they will bring to American consumers. CR is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. One of the things that CR is best known for is testing cars. Every year, our testers drive about half a million miles to put new cars through their paces, and we work with policymakers like you to advance policies for safer and cleaner cars. For decades, 
Federal greenhouse gas emission standards have played a critical role in reducing overall emissions from the transportation sector while encouraging automakers to innovate and offer increased clean vehicle options for consumers. The proposed EPA standards, if enacted, would bring more cleaner, cost-saving transportation technologies to consumers faster. The rule will save consumers money while reducing spending on healthcare tied to air pollution and disaster recovery tied to greenhouse gas emissions. I have three main points I would like to make based on CR's analysis. First, EPA standards are achievable. Second, consumer demand for EVs is far outpacing supply. And third, EVs save consumers money. The proposal for light duty vehicle standards is ambitious, but achievable. EPA's analysis that EVs are likely to be the most cost effective compliance pathway, but not the only option for automakers. Automakers can also use a mix of improvements in internal combustion, fuel efficiency, conventional hybrids, plug-in hybrids, and even hydrogen fuel cell vehicles to comply. EPA estimated that while an EV-only compliance pathway would require about two-thirds of vehicles sold to be EVs by 2032, industry is already on track to deliver around 50% EV sales by 2030 according to commitments made by automakers. <clears throat> Further, consumer challenges such as charging infrastructure and affordability will only continue to improve due to the unprecedented investments from the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. While funding for charging infrastructure, <clears throat> which provide funding for charging infrastructure and consumer tax credits, respectively. Consumers want EVs. Consumer demand for EVs has been soaring, increasing 350% between 2020 and 2022. Unfortunately, automakers have not been keeping up. There are now around 45 consumers who say they would definitely buy an EV for every EV being manufactured. Meanwhile, 30% of new car buyers are not even considering a conventional non-hybrid vehicle. CR estimates <clears throat> that EV-only compliance pathway would result in the production of enough EVs for approximately 25% of Americans to own one by the end of 2032. A 2022 CR survey found that already 36% of American adults were definitely or seriously considering an electric vehicle if they were bought to buy a vehicle today, indicating the consumer demand may already exceed what is needed to comply with these standards. Despite the rapid growth in consumer demand, people can't buy vehicles that don't exist. <clears throat> Consumers who want an EV right now often have to deal with long wait lists and dealer markups. Automakers are making investments to improve supply, but unfortunately, the growth in supply has still been lagging. EPA's proposal should help automakers catch up. EVs are cheaper to own. A 2022 our 2020 analysis by CR found that EVs are cheaper to own than comparable gasoline vehicles, even when factoring in higher purchase prices. EVs save an average of 60% on fuel and 50% on repairs and maintenance. This translates to between around six and $10,000 over the life of the vehicle, even factoring higher prices. Higher purchase prices, however, are likely to be temporary. As of January, automakers and battery manufacturers already to plan to invest $210 billion in US manufacturing by 2030. A 2022 analysis by ICCT found that EVs are rapidly approaching cost parity with <clears throat> conventional vehicles, even with a range of over 300 miles. <clears throat> in conclusion, EPA's proposed light duty vehicle standards will hit the accelerator, helping to drive automakers to catch up to consumer demand for cleaner vehicles, we see these rules as a win-win for consumers and the climate, putting over a trillion dollars back into consumers' pockets while delivering massive reductions in air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Harto. And finally, we're going to hear from Andrew Boyle from the American Trucking Association. Welcome. Thank you for the hometown shout-out, sir. Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Ricketts, and members of the subcommittee, Thank you for the opportunity to testify. In addition to serving as first vice chair of the American Trucking Associations, I'm co-president of Boyle Transportation, a trucking firm headquartered in Massachusetts. 
My company has the honor of doing important work, delivering life-saving medicine and transporting critical materiel for the US military. We employ 200 people, including 160 of the nation's finest professional truck drivers, and were recognized as having the number one work environment among smaller fleets in all of the US and Canada in 2020 and 2021. Boyle is a subsidiary of Ann Lowry Healthcare Group, a highly regarded logistics provider to the North American healthcare industry. We take tremendous pride in our environmental record. An EPA SmartWay partner since 2008, we have been a SmartWay high performer for five straight years and received EPA's Environmental Merit Award. In 2021, we became the first trucking company in North America to achieve certification for the rigorous ISO 14001 environmental management system. Our headquarters is solar powered. EPA shares, pardon me, ATA shares that commitment to sustainability as it represents a diverse industry which includes carriers ranging from enterprise fleets to single truck operations in which serves every economic sector. Trucks move 72% of America's freight tonnage, a number that will continue to grow. <coughs> Essentially, everything trucks a tr tr touches a truck. Thanks to collaboration between industry and government, today's clean diesel trucks produce 99% lower emissions than those from the 80s. 60 trucks today emit what just a single truck emitted in 1988. This progress is owed to both aggressive innovation and technically achievable national standards. We were aligned with another EPA emission standard slated to take effect in 2027, which will reduce NOx by yet another 83% until EPA recently announced that it was going to reopen that rule. How are manufacturers and fleets meant to comply with regulations that whimsically change with political preference? EPA also recently decided to create a state patchwork that undermines federal leadership by approving a waiver for California's so-called advanced clean trucks rule, which is heavily predicated on the adoption of electric trucks. While we share the passion for EVs and cars in late duty vehicles, projecting an automotive construct onto trucking industry dynamics is a massive mistake. And let me be clear, if battery electric trucks had adequate range, there was adequate charging infrastructure, and utilities could deliver the power, we truckers would be delighted. But let me explain our reality. Today, a clean diesel truck can spend 15 minutes fueling anywhere in the country and then have a range of about 1,200 miles before fueling again. In contrast, today's long-haul battery electric trucks have a range of about 150 to maybe 330 miles and can take up to 10 hours to charge. So for the same 1,200 mile journey, we'd go from 15 minutes of fueling a clean diesel truck once to charging today's BEV four to eight times for dozens and dozens of hours. And this is assuming there are charges where you need them. We would need far more trucks to haul the same amount of freight and each of those trucks would cost two to three times a comparable diesel truck. Converting the US fleet of class eight trucks to battery electric would require a $1 trillion investment, which ultimately would flow to consumers. We welcome the opportunity to provide real world, factual and constructive input into the legislative and rulemaking process. We recognize that most people don't understand how the trucking industry works behind the scenes to supply the American public but we can't allow unrealistic timelines, a state patchwork, and technically unachievable regulations to set trucking up for failure. Remember, we deliver food, medicine, baby formula. Failure is not merely inconvenient, it's catastrophic. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Boyle, very much. Uh, now we'll turn to questions from our panel, and uh, I will begin by just pointing out that when I served in the House of Representatives, I authored the fuel economy language in the 2007 Energy Independence and Security Act that kick-started the new race to the top for vehicle efficiency, and that legislation made it clear 
that we must set the maximum feasible standard for fuel economy. The EPA standards are no different. They must, quote, reflect the greatest degree of emission reduction achievable through available technology. <coughs> well, the Inflation Reduction Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, and the Chips and Science Act, Congress invested more than $135 billion to make clean vehicle technology more available than ever. So to each of the witnesses, do you believe that investments from these bills are making clean vehicles more affordable uh, and available? Um, we'll begin with you, Ms. Harris, then Mr. Hutto, and then you, Mr. Boyle. Thank you so much for your question, Senator. Um, I think the short answer is yes. We are seeing that um, the prices of upfront prices of electric vehicle costs are reducing, and that is in part to a large, a large part due to the Inflation Reduction Act and the tax incentives passed by this body. But additionally, we know even today that the total cost of ownership of electric vehicles is still cheaper than a comparable gasoline car. Um, and we are seeing an increase of desire for these vehicles from the um, American people as well. Meaning that over the life expectancy of the vehicle, yes. you spend so much less on electricity than you do on oil. For yes, the and also the um, the maintenance costs of the vehicles are lower as well. Yes, Mr. Haro. Uh, yes, yes, we do do believe that these uh, these policies are helping to accelerate and bring more EVs to consumers cheaper. Uh, and the more automakers do something, uh, the better they get at it. Uh, learning by doing economies of scale are two of the biggest drivers of cost declines in any industry. The more clean vehicles automakers deliver, the cheaper they will <clears throat> be able to offer them to consumers. All right. All, I, you know. Okay. And I, have you finished? Yeah. Okay. And let me go to you, Mr. Boyle. What, what incentives are most helpful to the trucking industry in the legislation thus far uh, to increase the ambition to move to clean vehicles? Well, thus far, you know, the uh, adoption of BEVs, so in a heavy-duty truck, the upcharge is roughly $300,000. So the incentives barely covers the uh, federal excise tax, <laughs> and w which is an issue we'd like to bring up because I know some of your colleagues have been advocating for us a huge impediment to buy newer, cleaner trucks, even today's trucks is a federal excise tax that was uh, installed near, more than 100 years ago to finance World War I. So a big issue when we look at the emissions in aggregate right now is that not so much that today's trucks aren't clean enough, it's just that of the fleet on the road, not enough are today's trucks. And these, this is one lever we have to kind of make it more affordable for, for fleets and operators to buy today's clean trucks. Yeah, and uh, my father was a truck driver, so I grew I'm up aware, in a house with a truck driver. Uh, as my father, so I'm very conscious of this profession and the need to have these vehicles be able to um, uh, operate. Uh, Mr. Hato, um, do the investments which are being made in EV charging help to deal with the range anxiety that people have had in purchasing an EV in the past? Absolutely. Char charging infrastructure is one of the biggest barriers to EV adoption <coughs> in the U.S., and the bipartisan infrastructure law provides significant investments to especially uh, roll out those chargers in areas where the free market is, is lagging, states like Senator Ricketts, uh, Nebraska, and as well as low-income areas of the country. So it's really targeted at filling the gaps where the market is missing. Uh, to help consumers feel confident that they can buy an electric vehicle. Ms. Harris, how quickly is this transition occurring in terms of consumers' demand and the purchases of electric vehicles, especially the light duty, the SUVs? Yeah, absolutely. So we are seeing an, a, a great increase in the interest in electric vehicles. Last year, electric vehicle sales were about 4.5% over the course of the year. Um, and in 2022, I'm sorry, in 2021, they were about 4.5%. And in 2022, that rose to um, about 7% over time. And we've even seen that in December of 2022, that was almost up to 9 or 10% sales as well. So there is a continuous increase in interest of these vehicles, and we are seeing that demand um, increasing annually. Okay, beautiful, thank you. 
Uh, Senator Ricketts. Thank you very much, Senator Ricketts, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Harris, do you believe it's appropriate to analyze only the tailpipe when calculating greenhouse gas emissions? Thank you so much for your question, Senator. Um, I believe that we that electric vehicles and the tailpipe emissions from the transportation sector are a major source of toxic pollutions in, in, in the United States. Okay, so what about the fact that that method misses significant emissions generated through the extraction of rare earth minerals in foreign countries that are needed to create EV batteries? There have been many studies that have shown that electric vehicles today from well to wheel are still cleaner than compared to a gasoline vehicle. But you haven't analyzed the uh, need for rare earth minerals and the mining, uh, the significant mining that has to occur. So can you confirm that lithium, cobalt, manganese, nickel, and graphite are all critical to the manufacturing of electric vehicle batteries? Many of the batteries that are currently made today for electric vehicles do require those minerals. Do you know which country is the third largest producer of lithium and controls 60% of global battery grade lithium refining capacity? I do not have that number in front of me today. Okay, well, it's China. Do you know which country is responsible for over 50% of cobalt exports? I do not have that number in front of me today. It is the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Do you know which country is responsible for nearly 75% of global exports of manganese? I do not have that number in front of me today. It's China. Do you know which country is responsible for the most exports of nickel? I do not have that number in front of me today. That would be Indonesia. Do you know which country is responsible for nearly half of the global graphite exports? I do not have that number in front of me today. That is also China. Do any of these countries have anywhere near the st stringent environmental regulations the United States has? I cannot speak to that today. So you don't know? I mean, there you don't know whether these countries are mining in a more environmentally friendly way than the United States? Oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood the question. Could you please repeat it? Do any of these countries have anywhere near the stringent environmental regulations that the United States has? Oh, my apologies, not to my awareness. If climate change really is a worldwide problem, how does shifting the responsibility of mineral extraction to these countries help us reduce worldwide emissions? Thank you so much for the question. I will say that there are many investments and incentives that are happening here in the United States to bring the supply chain to, to the United States. You know, I have uh, a rare earth mine in my state that has been trying to open for over 10 years and still doesn't have the environmental permitting to open. Uh, there is no way that the standards and the materials needed to produce and manufacture in the United States can happen in 10 years. Um, and, and to ramp up the supply even in foreign countries that have far lower environmental standards, not to mention human labor standards, um, it, it's it, this is not possible to do. It's going to take four to six times more product and then the mining of and milling of that product over a 10-year period to meet the regulatory standards that the EPA is advocating for. It's going to raise greenhouse gases all over the world, including in China, Indonesia, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It's going to uh, create child labor and human labor uh, issues that are deplorable. And we're doing that all so we can provide a vehicle that costs $65,000 to the American consumer, and that if you're in an accident, 
you have to replace the whole vehicle because the battery can't be damaged. I mean, uh, there, to me, there's really nothing about this idea that is reflective of global reality. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I would like to enter into the record uh, this article uh, about the gamble on critical minerals uh, that is being undertaken with regard to uh, this proposed uh, EPA regulation. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. I yield back. Okay. Uh, Senator uh, Kramer is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, witnesses. Uh, I want to just, I have to say, I was taking more notes while I was listening to Senator Lummis than I came with, but a um, couple, couple of things that struck me right away, as well as listening to your, your uh, earlier testimony, um, Mr. Boyle. We acknowledge they're heavier. We acknowledge they're more expensive. M maybe the incentives don't even cover the, the excise tax. What does it cost to insure a vehicle like a, tr a large truck that has these extra costs and weights and, and an infrastructure, frankly, not designed for 5,000 more pounds uh, per axle and those kinds of... Right, sir. Yes. It, in, it's hard to tell because that we're so... Uh, the consumer oriented, the consumer facing EV product is so much further ahead, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about a very heavy duty, under high stress, uh, corrosive environment. Each, just so we're clear on the scale of the issue, each electric vehicle battery for a heavy duty truck weighs 8,000 pounds. And you need at least two of them. So we're talking the weight of, you know, four or five cars. And our, my friends and peers in the industry nationwide who have tried to make efforts to put in, say, hey, I'm going to convert a dozen forklifts to electric, or I want to tee up a facility for 30 electric trucks. There is no power. The utilities come back, the cities come back and say, is this some kind of joke? One friend tried to put in, in Illinois, a, uh, a facility, tee it up for 30 trucks electrification. The city came back and said, this is some kind of joke. You're asking for more draw than the entire city requires. And just to give you an idea, 30, 50 trucks, that's like a five, six megawatt application. The factory that makes the trucks is a two megawatt factory. Mm -hmm. So we're playing checkers right now, and we'd be delighted to have more choices. If the power and in infrastructure is not available, it's not even a consideration for trucking. Yet California wants to make it immediate, effective next January. That's the only choice. No diesel trucks. No OEM is going to be compliant with the, e with the California CARB standard for a diesel electric truck starting in January. They'll have product due to credits and so forth, but none is going to be technically compliant. What are we talking about here? We're trying to serve the country and supply uh, commodities that are essential to everyday life. So before any of the, this is not kind of a choice. We have the cart before the horse right now. Well, and the fight over the infrastructure piece is not a small uh, matter either. When you start talking about how do you socialize costs for a, 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 a grid that covers every every inch and, and socialize the costs of every little generator in every street corner. And that another issue I'm not suggesting we get into right now, but building even more on what uh, Senator Lummis was talking about um, with regard to the supply chain, Congo, Indonesia, um, China, and the human rights violations and the workforce challenges, certainly standards that don't meet ours. Um, to me, those are higher and of greater importance um, than, than some of the other issues we're trying to solve. Um, but here's the other irony. Y'all, she has an opportunity in her own state that hasn't been done. We know of two critical mines, critical minerals mines that have been shut down before they even had an EA in this country by this administration this year. One in Minnesota, Twin Metals, and one in Alaska. Pebble mine, so we, you're right, the cart is before the horse. Let's build, let's build the horse and, and find the supply chain that can produce some of these things before we start incentivizing things. The other thing I'd bring up, um, unlike Senator Lamas, I don't come from, from a tropical um, environment like Wyoming. I come from an Arctic <laughs> state of North Dakota. The suggestion, the sug or Nebraska, which is balmy by comparison. Um, <laughs> um, but the, the performance in cold weather is not just it's, unproven, it's proven to be horrible. And I just can't imagine pushing this standard on, on North Dakota. That's right, sir. So the, so the battery degrades in cold conditions up to about a third. So that range I talked about, 180, right. 150 to 330, 
it's degraded by 30%. Is range fairly important in the trucking industry? Is that uh, if you <laughs> want to talk about range anxiety, we truckers would need therapy. Mm -hmm. Okay. I bet. Yeah. Um, with, with that, my, my points made, you, you, you appreciate you all being here. And I yield. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Senator Ricketts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Boyle, you talked about the uh, trucking industry. Talk a little about, you know, it's, uh, the trucks are heavy. You said like 8,000 pounds for a battery. Does that mean that you can't haul as much? Your payload is reduced? Is that correct? That's correct, which means more trucks to haul the same amount of freight. So you're going to need more trucks on the road. Does that mean that consumers are going to have to put up with more trucks on the road as they're driving around, right? There's going to be more traffic? Certainly. And is there a shortage of truck drivers in your industry today? We estimate about roughly 70, 72,000 short currently. But you would need more truck drivers if you're going to need more trucks. Is that fair? Yes, sir. Okay, so talk to me about what your experience is from your industry about some of your friends you talked about doing it, but along those lines of more trucks and what sort of, how many more trucks we talk? Yeah, so, so we have uh, members of, our, of ATA who have, you know, limited scope operations where it be, they're testing BEVs. And what they found is that they need about a three to two or occasionally two to one ratio of trucks, meaning like for every one, the, the routes and missions that one truck would do in the internal combustion engine, reliability was high. They now have to use two BEVs due to charging downtime, reliability, et cetera. And is, that, is it fair to say that's more expensive? Certainly. And uh, one of the things um, uh, also that uh, you were talking about is if you've got this uh, cost, oh, and also uh, the tractor trailers themselves. I was told uh, by somebody in the industry that a regular tractor trailer diesel run is $180,000. These are about $500,000. Is that ballpark correct? Yes, yes. So for the tractor part of a tractor trailer, yes, about 180 to 200 for a kind of sleeper truck. And then uh, in comparison to the 450000 price point for a battery. And I just want to reemphasize something you said in your testimony. Who ultimately is going to pay for this? I think you said trillion dollars in additional costs. Who's going to pay for that? Ultimately, it flows to the consumer. The American consumer will end up paying that. Yeah. So now the American consumer is going to have to foot the bill for all this, so forth. And I think that there was that AT um, uh, RI study that showed that the trucking industry used about 10% of our power generation, electric. I, I think it's actually more, sir. It's closer to 14%. So 14%. we'd be putting an addition, incremental load of 14% on the grid. Okay. So, Mr. Hardo, can you help me? I, we got this one study that talked about trucks would need 14% more cars. Would, or would, oh wait, 14% more. I thought it was 14%. Is that 14% more or 14% of over, overall power generation, Mr. Boyle? Uh, to, to, well, effectively, it means we need 14% more power generation. because. Okay. Got it. Yeah. And I think the electric vehicles was 40, if you electrify the entire fleet, it's 40% of our current power capacity generation. That's a study out there right now. Are you aware, are there studies where somebody has put pencil to paper to see how much more we would have to increase our power generation that has different numbers than what we just talked about here? Uh, yes, the US DOE research labs, uh, I, f I forget which, which ones uh, have done this type of analysis. I know at least for the uh, light duty vehicle sector, uh, we're looking at uh, increased growth in generation demand of about 1% per year, which is within, uh, well within what the uh, electricity industry has done in the past, you know, when we deployed AC. Really, Mr. Harder, 1% per year? When Gavin Newsom last year announced in the same, within the same week that he wanted to ban the sale of all internal combustion engines in California by 2035, and then told people with electric vehicles, you can't charge them in the afternoon because the grid can't handle it. Yes. Doesn't One, that seem to like a disconnect to you? What? It doesn't seem like a disconnect it, it, to you? No, it, it's, it's about 1% per year in overall generation need. As well, utilities have a lot of tools to move around when EVs charge. Uh, time of use rates, managed charging, Eventually, we'll have vehicle-to-grid technology where EVs, when they're not being used, can push power back to the grid and help get through those peak periods in the late afternoon when everybody's running their AC, everybody's coming home, cooking dinner, uh, in demand is very high. So when you say managing your thing, you're, you're talking about, when you say managing your charging, you're talking about, like Gavin Newsom's talking about managing, don't charge it in the afternoon, is that what you're saying? It, you, you, can, you can plug in, you can have your car sitting in your driveway, plugged in, 
and you, your utility can just you know switch it on and off for a few minutes for a few hours. Uh, you know, typically you only need it charging. So if they could do that, why, is it, why isn't California doing that right now? Like, why would he have to tell people don't charge your cars? <laughs> It, it still takes a little bit. You know, we're very we're at the we're in the first inning of the EV transition, and you know a lot of this stuff's going to get a lot better as we scale up. Yeah, eventually. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mr. Hardo. Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, thank you, Senator Ricketts. Um, if Senator Merkley is ready, or I could go for another round, then recognize you. Are you ready to go now? I Okay, so I, I will. So let, let me. Uh, so let me come back to you, uh, Mr. Hato. Um, is it not true that the Inflation uh, Reduction Act protects against the use of minerals from countries of concern that make vehicles ineligible for the tax credit if they're using um, minerals from China, from Russia, from countries of concern? Yeah, ab absolutely. The Inflation Reduction Act puts strong incentives in place for automakers to realign their supply chains and, and secure them away from countries of concern. Yeah, so countries of concern is just another way of saying countries we're not really confident of having the correct environmental standards or that we can trust them as a national strategic partner for, some, for a transition as important as this. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So right now we're hearing some complaints from some automakers that the new IRS rules are not going to allow their vehicles to qualify uh, because they're importing too many materials from China. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. But many of those automakers are rapidly moving to realign their supply chains in order to qualify for these very strong incentives. So in other words, you, you heard um, Senator Lummis um, you know, go down this whole list of concerns, which is obviously the whole point of the CHIPS Act, the whole point of the Inflation Reduction Act, the whole point of the infrastructure bill. It's just to say to China, we don't need your materials anymore, uh, and, uh, uh, and to Russia, we don't need your oil any more than we need your caviar, and to Saudi Arabia, we don't need your oil any more than we need your sand. Okay, we're fine, you can keep it. Uh, we're moving in a new direction. So that's really what those three big bills are all about. Is it, is it not true, Mr. Hardo, that that's the goal? Yeah, yeah that's correct. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, we're going to be in a little transition period right now, obviously, uh, where there'll be a little bit of a grace period for some of these uh, materials to be used. Uh, but, um, uh, but after that, we're on to a whole new era where we're not only using materials from countries that we have close partnerships with, but also that we're gonna make it in America. All right, so go through that, Mr. Hato, a little bit. Yeah, I mean, large portions of the world's reserves of critical minerals are actually from countries like Canada, Australia, and Chile, with which we have strong trade, trade partnerships with. Uh, and, and again, automakers are working hard to realign their supply chains uh, to meet these standards. Yeah, and uh, are they making that transition? Uh, the, the, the massive investments that they, they are putting be, in, into this transition to electric vehicles say that they are. Say that they are. Now, uh, Ms. Harris, um, uh, some, there's some complaints that this is too ambitious, uh, but you're saying the real world says no, but there's a big appetite for these vehicles. Yes, that's correct. Um, to Mr. Harto's point, automakers have already announced over $210 billion of investments here in the United States to help with that transition, and as you mentioned, to help bring that supply chain here to the United States, which will continue to increase the benefits to the economy and to drivers. Yeah, so I had this problem actually back in the 1990s. I was chairman over telecommunications. And unfortunately, Alexander Graham Bell would have still recognized our phone system. This black rotary dial phone or a cell phone that was the size of a brick that uh, Gordon Gecko was using in Wall Street. I'm just, oh my God, how can we move to the future? So my bill that I was the principal Democratic author of in 1996, break up all these monopolies. 
this stultifying technological growth. And by 2000, four years after the bill passed, we had a broadband revolution. We had a dot-com bubble. But everyone had broadband except for the most rural parts of the country and the poorest people in our country. And it had just been held up. So we heard from the auto industry for so many years, we can't do this. You don't know how hard it is. Uh, if you knew that you what you were asking for, you wouldn't even raise the subject. Well, now, of course, finally, the auto industry is accepting the future. Now, they let Tesla get a huge lead on them by maintaining their denial that you could do it. But the battery technology, uh, all of these um, new technologies, they're all happening and improving very rapidly. Now, the interesting thing about the 1996 Telecommunications Act is that it created a broadband revolution. And what is the electricity revolution? The electricity revolution is a broadband revolution. You can manage the electricity coming in off the ocean, off the prairies, off of roofs. You can manage the electricity inside of people's homes and buildings. And you can manage automobiles and trucks feeding the electricity back into the home or into the grid. All of that is now possible because of the broadband revolution. And this revolution is going to create all new revolutions in battery storage technologies, in the ability for us to be able to imagine where our electricity comes from or what kind of vehicles we have. So there's always been really very strong opposition to these kinds of technological revolutions. And I understand that because it's just part of looking at the world in a rearview mirror. And we've got to be sensitive to industries that are going to be impacted. The legislation, the regulations are trying to do that, and I'm sure there are some accommodations that can be made. But nonetheless, because of the imperative of us to back out imported oil, national security issues, to reduce greenhouse gases going up, national security uh, issue, we really don't have a choice. And this bill is saying to China, to Russia, to other countries, we don't, we're not going to need your minerals anymore. We're not going to need your parts anymore. And I think that's a big part of what the message is that is being sent to the private sector. And it's largely responding. And we've, we're going to have to make some adjustments, obviously. But I still think that we've got an incredible future uh, that we can look forward to. Uh, let me turn and recognize Senator Merkley from Oregon. Let me turn and recognize uh, the chairman of the uh, the full committee, Senator Carr. Thanks. And I, I appreciate, uh, Senator Markey, you letting me uh, slip ahead of you. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, let me just say I appreciate you having the hearing today. Uh, the uh, largest source of uh, carbon uh, uh, dioxide emissions, or carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, comes from our mobile sources. I think it's about 30 percent, about 25 percent from power plants, about 20 percent from uh, manufacturing operations, including cement plants, including steel mills, that kind of thing. And uh, so uh, we, uh, we're trying to make sure we focus especially on those three, but including focusing on, on, on autos. I'll never forget, that I've shared this with some of my colleagues before, going, I used to go to the Detroit Auto Show uh, every December, every January actually. And when Delaware had uh, uh, two auto, big auto plants, big Chrysler plant and big Chrysler plant, that employed about three or 4,000 people at each of them, which is a big deal for a little state. And uh, I, um, I uh, remember being at the Detroit Auto Show about 10 years ago, and I met a young woman named uh, uh, Mary Barra. Mary Barra, that's it for a lot of people, that's a familiar name now, because she's the, uh, not just the CEO of uh, General Motors, she is the, uh, I think, the chair of the business roundtable. And, uh, but I met her, and uh, I met her uh, at a, a ceremony they had just uh, at the Detroit Auto Show had announced what was a, a car was selected as car of the year, what uh, uh, SUV or truck was suggested or su uh, selected as the um, truck of the year. And the, uh, the car of the year was Chevrolet Volt. Chevrolet Volt, and it was a hybrid. And uh, they don't make them anymore, but it was a hybrid. And I remember uh, talking uh, with her, and she told me that it got 38 miles on a charge, 38 miles on a charge. And after that, battery was depleted, and uh, they, the, the, the car would be on, uh, have to operate on uh, uh, gasoline, or, you know, diesel, whatever. And uh, uh, 10 years later, uh, she's, it's a big deal. She's like the chairman of the company, and 
chairman of the business roundtable. And I'm, I was trying to get uh, GM about maybe a year ago to join Ford and Volvo and some other uh, co companies in really signing on to fuel efficiency standards, low emission standards. And uh, I remember, uh, I'll never forget what she said to me. She said, Senator, I'm all in on electric. She said, that's where the future is. Uh, I know it. It's, it's, they're cheaper to, uh, to build, uh, to maintain, and uh, climate change is real. And uh, the, it uh, makes sense. She said, three things happen to happen before people will buy the vehicles that uh, uh, we're prepared to make, the electric vehicles we're prepared to make in the future. Number one, 300-mile uh, range. And she said, that's on the industry. Not, not on the government. She said, Second thing we need is uh, the ability to charge uh, batteries in minutes, not hours. She said that's on the industry. That's not on the government. She said the third thing is on the government, and that is to make sure that we have throughout uh, not just Delaware and places on the East Coast, but all over the country, charging stations and fueling stations for, for vehicles that, that we're prepared to build. She said we don't do that. We'll never uh, have, be as successful here as, as we'd like to. Uh, I, another conversation that I that I, I, I remember was with a, a, a person. I remember in a conversation with uh, I, I think it was uh, Amazon and FedEx, and we're talking about their delivery vehicles and whether or not they they uh, what did they use electric vehicles? Did they use diesel vehicles? Some combination thereof. And I I'm not sure if it was uh, uh, Amazon or. Uh, or FedEx, but uh, over a relatively short period of time, they migrated almost entirely to electric. And uh, they did it, and I'll never forget, he ex explained to me, the fellow we uh, talked to from uh, whichever company it was, said that uh, uh, the uh, right business decision for us, set aside concerns about you know, climate change or global warming or sea level rise, he said, for, for us, the, the right business decision was electric vehicles. Same, th same reasons that Mary Barr had given me, you know. Low uh, it's not just low emissions, it's low maintenance. They're easy to build, easier to maintain. And, uh, and she didn't say this, but as a, the owner of an electric vehicle that I've had now for about, about two years, it's, they're fun to drive. And that's kind of hard to put a, uh, a price tag on, but they are just a hell of a lot of fun. And uh, for people who, uh, I can see some, some heads in the audience here nodding, yes, they really are, so. Uh, so for, for those, uh, those reasons, they, I think that uh, uh, that's where we need to, uh, to, to go, ought to go. And uh, having said that, not, it, 10, 15, 20, my last vehicle was a 2001 Chrysler Town & Country minivan with 600,000 miles on it. And uh, there's some people just love their vehicles, maybe some people in the audience. Uh, they love their vehicles and never want to change it. And they're going to keep the vehicles for 100,000, 200,000 miles and maybe more. Uh, but uh, so we're not going to everybody. We're not going to hit a switch and just move over and take EVs or, or hydrogen-powered vehicles. But uh, we'll eventually migrate uh, away. Um, the the other thing I would I would just say, I uh, I mentioned in another hearing today, uh, what uh, what we're facing in terms of uh, climate change, sea level rise, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and it's a uh, it's it's a uh, we got to be smart enough to let not let this happen. And the question is, can we be smart enough to avoid uh, that, the dire consequences that we hear about all the time? Are we smart enough to do that and at the same time create jobs and economic opportunity? And uh, well, I would take away from my conversations with Mary Barr and the folks at General Motors, and, fo uh, and frankly, the, uh, uh, Bill Ford at uh, Ford Motors, and the, the folks at uh, uh, that, the Amazon, the delivery company, either it was Amazon or, or FedEx, that. Uh, that offered the, 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 I thought, very smart, cogent arguments for, for uh, uh, supporting EV. So, so there we go. Uh, we don't have to do it just because it feels good, but it's actually good business sense. And uh, we have, uh, my wife and I have uh, some uh, four-step grandchildren. I want to make sure that they grow up and have a planet to grow up on and grow old on and have good jobs and good jobs it comes to that. So Mr. President, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. President, <laughs> I always knew you would make it to the top. Although this, this, uh, your health today may suggest there might be a problem. I don't, hopefully not. But I, uh, I, first I want to ask unanimous consent, uh, a, uh, I asked for unanimous consent, a study by the International Energy Agency that compares the greenhouse gas life cycle analysis between an internal combustion vehicle and battery electric vehicles. Uh, and uh, it's hard to read my staff's writing. 
but it says, <laughs> then considering the mining of critical minerals, electric vehicles are substantially less in emissions compared to internal combustion vehicles. We'll change this for the record. But uh, I think I'm asking unanimous consent for, uh, for a study by the International Energy Agency here. So I have a question for Mr. Hardo, and then I'll be out of your hair. Mr. Hardo, Chris Hardo, right? Yep. Um, one of our three favorite words, Chris, we have three boys. Um, uh, I want to ask, I want to thank the, the chair for holding the hearing. Uh, the transportation sector, as I've suggested, is a major source of, uh, of carbon emissions. And got to do something about it. We are doing something about it. And uh, EPA's newly uh, proposed light duty vehicle and heavy duty vehicle greenhouse gas emission standards will reduce emissions of criteria pollutants, uh, greenhouse gases, and air toxics, creating significant benefits for public health and our climate. The, uh, this issue is especially personal for us in Delaware which I've mentioned a million times for my, 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 my committee members can tell you a million times how Delaware is the lowest lying state in the country. Our state is uh, sinking, the seas around us are rising. It's not a good combination. Uh, but uh, uh, here's, here's my question, question for you, Mr. Hardo. Uh, we always talk about the tremendous clean air and climate benefits of EPA's clean car rule, but as a car enthusiast with, as I said earlier, my own electric vehicle, I also want to hear about uh, what these rules will mean for American drivers. Does your research show that many drivers want to buy electric vehicles, uh, and if so, why? And how will these clean car rules help protect drivers from volatile global oil prices, which are often influenced by the whims of dictators? That's my question. Great. Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you for your question. Sure. Um, so yes, these, these rules will del deliver consumer savings to Americans uh, EVs on the road today, despite their higher prices, already deliver lifetime cost savings to consumers uh, while reducing the volatility of their monthly fuel budget. Uh, you know, e electricity prices change over time, but they change very slowly in fairly predictable ways, whereas oil prices fluctuate wildly, uh, which can even if you thought you could afford the vehicle when you first bought it, if, if oil prices rise a dollar or two dollars, you, you might have to, to choose between feeding your family and, and fueling your vehicle to get to, to work every day. Right. Anybody else want to comment on that? Ms. Harris? Um, thank you so much, Senator. Just just uplifting what Mr. Mr. Harto said, um, we are already today seeing significant cost savings um, for the for a, an electric vehicle compared to a gasoline powered car. And you know, since the transportation costs tend to be a large energy burden for drivers and consumers, um, transitioning to zero emission vehicles is a, a win for consumers' pocketbooks as well. In addition to a lot of the points that you uplift it for improving um, air quality and health of Americans and also make us more globally competitive too. So there's many, many benefits and there is an increased interest from drivers to, uh, to purchase these vehicles. And Senator Carper, if I may. Uh, I, excuse me, just, oh, I, I was just handed notice that I need to go give a speech on the floor right now. So I could be, I should be two people right now, but I apologize. I need to, I need to, but I, we'd, I'd welcome anything you want to give us for the record, please. And thank you. I thank apologize. you. Uh, the the uh, Thanks, Mr. gentleman's time has expired, and his request for inclusion in the uh, record of the documents that he referred to, without objection, uh, will be so ordered. A senator from uh, Oregon. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and greetings to you all, and thank you for your testimony. And, and I just want to repeat what I heard you all saying, uh, Mr. Harto, that life cycle costs for a consumer, they're, they're better off by an electric vehicle? That is correct. And do uh, you agree with that, uh, Ms. Harris? Yes. So if I'm buying an electric vehicle and I'm wondering, well, how many miles am I going to get on a kilowatt hour? What's the answer? A recent study that I saw said that the average range of an electric vehicle today is about 290 no, it's miles. Not, it's not the range. How far am I going to go oh. on a kilowatt hour? No. Somewhere between three and four miles per Four kilowatt. miles. Four miles on most of uh, the, the Bolt, for example. And uh, I pay 12 cents. Uh, for each kilowatt hour that comes to my house. So therefore, it costs me how much to go one mile? Yeah, about three or four cents. Three cents. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. That's incredible. And I, I think that's why the uh, savings, life cycle savings are significant, not to mention the savings when you have uh, 
an internal combustion vehicle doing uh, in tens of thousands of little explosions that have to be managed. You have all kinds of parts to repair that you don't have an electric vehicle. I did, however, have a problem in that uh, a mouse got under the hood of my bolt and ate a bunch of key wires out of reach. So I did have to have one repair, uh, unfortunately. Uh, well, I have a, a 360 square foot, uh, 20 panel uh, soil panels on my roof. And uh, so far this, th well, this month, they produce about 30 kilowatt hours a day, just 360 square feet, which means that the average mileage that I get from my car out of this little tiny solar array on my roof is about 120 miles. I can drive my car 120 miles a day on the electricity coming on that little tiny array on my roof. To me, that's incredible. And I think it's helpful for people to hear kind of those basic numbers because it doesn't translate initially uh, that uh, just a little bit of uh, panels on your roof and you can, you can drive. Well, think about that. If you're doing a 100 miles a day for a year, that uh, 36,000 miles on just that little sunlight coming in on your roof. Anyway. Um, it has to be, however, when you're on the road, uh, outside of the range of your fueling up at home, charging up at home, it has to be as easy to charge up as it is to fill up. Have we reached that point yet, either one of you? No, we haven't. Uh, but these, these EPA standards really help solve the chicken and egg problem with charging infrastructure. Private industry isn't going to invest billions of dollars in putting in chargers if they aren't sure that the vehicles that need them are going to be there. Uh, they can only, they can only, industry promises only go so far. Having set rules really sets, sets a direction for the industry and allows them to invest with confidence. Well, we do have to grow the charging station as we grow the number of vehicles, but something else that would be helpful, and I've sent a number of letters to our transportation secretary, I've had many conversations with him about this, is the complexity of charging when you find that station that's open. Uh, some of them charge monthly fees. Some of them uh, charge by how t much time you're hooked up. Some of them charge by kilowatt hour, but don't tell you what the charge is, so, uh, and so forth. My argument with, or my advocacy to the transportation secretary is make it as transparent as gas stations are. Every, every single one of them, you know what you're gonna pay per gallon before you drive in. Can't we do the same and, and uh, have people know how much you're gonna pay per kilowatt hour when you uh, bring up to the charging station? Would that be a good idea? Sure, yeah, sounds great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> those, those are supposed to be like softball questions, maybe leading questions. Um, because some stations charge 15 cents in Oregon. Some change, charge 45 cents. And you don't really know till you, you get there. Uh, and um, that will really help because there's a certain anxiety about the complexity of charging stations, totally unnecessary. So with the grants that we have in a legislation we passed last year, my argument was require people to standardize in a way to get rid of that anxiety about the complexity of a charging station. Now for folks who travel a lot, you eventually figure out, you figure out the system, you figure out how to check the apps, but it shouldn't, doesn't need to be uh, that hard. So I read, Mr. Harto, that 36% of Americans were definitely or seriously considering an electric vehicle. And I certainly, uh, after having one, understand that there's a lot to love. But what is the main reason Americans are considering an electric vehicle? Is it the cost savings that we refer to? Because I think most Americans don't really know that yet. Uh, or is it how quiet they are? Is it the lack of repairs? Is it the environmental sensitivity? What's, what's really uh, driving their, their interest? Yeah, I mean, every American has their own, own reasons for choosing an electric vehicle. Some of them choose them for climate reasons. Some of them choose them for cost reasons. Others just like that they're faster and, and perform better and, and they enjoy driving them. So there's a lot of different entry points for Americans into electric vehicles. Any insights, Ms. Harris, on the, what you consider like the top two drivers for people's interest in electric vehicles? Nothing more to add than what Mr. Harto said. I think there's a variety of reasons, but I do think that the, air, uh, the, um, the cost savings for drivers is, is definitely one of the reasons why they continue to purchase electric vehicles. I must say, early on in the electric vehicle uh, world, uh, it was the glue yourself to the back of your seat acceleration 
uh, that put a big smile on a lot of people's uh, faces. Uh, and um, I must say, I nearly wrecked an electric vehicle the first time I drove one because it was like, oh, I, I was on the freeway before I, I knew what had happened. Um, and so I'm glad I made it through that, otherwise I wouldn't, wouldn't be here today. Uh, my time's expired, so I'm going to turn it back over to the chairman. Thanks. Thank you, and now we'll uh, turn and recognize the senator from Alaska, Mr. Sullivan. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to our witnesses. Um, Mr. Boyle, I'd like to uh, focus on some of the issues relating to the trucking industry. Um, you know, there's been a really good story on the fact that 70% of our economy's total tonnage has been coming from you and your industry, and there has been very significant um, greenhouse gas emission reductions, primarily through um, your own uh, work. Isn't that true? Yes, sir. And do you think that's been highlighted much? You know, the, the line of demarcation that mo most people refer to with diesel technology emissions was 2010. So right now, if we look at the national fleet of Class A trucks, 47% of them are still pre-2010. So there's an 83% reduction going from 20, 2010 to today. And Senator Carper and others have actually facilitated uh, uh, legislation and grants to help refresh this fleet. So we want to remove impediments for people to buy today's trucks. And so that's gonna help make the environment cleaner, correct? With the existing infrastructure, without the trillion dollar investment, yes. Well, listen, uh, I, I think that's a story that we need to hear more about. Um, but I'm very concerned, like many, bipartisan concern, by the way, of the EPA's um, using its regulatory power to transition the vehicle fleet uh, at a way in which I think is not an achievable pace. These rules are de facto bans on etern internal combustion engines, and that's why Senator Ricketts and I intend to introduce res resolutions of disapproval under the Congressional Review Act, both for heavy duty truck proposals and EPA light and medium vehicle proposals. Um, and I ask uh, Mr. Chairman unanimous consent to uh, enter into the record a recent op-ed from the Wall Street Journal saying Biden's EPA rules remake the auto industry? Without objection. Thank you. Um, Mr. Boyle, do you agree that um, the regulations are an unprecedented <coughs> move by the EPA to dramatically move forward something that we think probably violates the recent Supreme Court decision in, an EP, in EPA West Virginia in terms of, hey, if you're going to have regulatory authority to remake the whole economy, you need to get that authority from the Congress. What's your view on that? So, so we work in interstate commerce. My trucks transport cancer drugs. When we impede interstate commerce, the products that are essential to daily life don't get delivered. So yes, by, by passing the buck and allowing states to uh, enact their own regulations on emissions, how the, the market is not large enough for innovators to address <coughs> each individual state. Um, and then furthermore, yes, the, there, historically we've had great, our OEMs and other stakeholders in industry have great cooperation and collaboration with EPA on technical standards and on timelines that were achievable. If we don't do that and we cede to the states, we end up with this patchwork. And then furthermore, as we discussed earlier, as of January of this coming year, there will be no truck that's compliant, internal combustion truck that's compliant with California CARB standards. In battery electric trucks, there is no, if we, everybody in this room took off their socks and shoes and we counted fingers and toes, we would have more of them than there are chargers for heavy duty trucks. So we have to establish, we have to play a little bit more chess, not checkers, get the power generation, establish the infrastructure for chargers, and then by all means we would embrace this notion. But to do so without that in place sets trucking up for failure, which in turn sets up consumers for failure in higher costs. Thank you. Let me ask one final question for all the panelists. The administration, and I think this is a bipartisan issue, says that they want America not China in particular, to source the critical minerals 
that we will need for electric vehicles and so many other uh, clean energy technologies. And yet, um, this kind of timeline doesn't give our country the ability to mine critical minerals that we have. By the way, in Alaska, we have the highest environmental standards in the world on mining critical minerals. If we need critical minerals and we want to get away from China, the reliance on China, and we have the highest standards in the world and we can employ our own people, why wouldn't we do that? So you may have seen Senator Manchin's statement on the, what he called the EPA's radical vehicle admission standards, and he said that the one thing that's going to happen here is that it's going to only result in more energy secure and powerful China in strengthening our reliance on minerals and technologies from China. This is a Democrat saying this. Uh, I'm meeting with, in the next couple minutes, a group from the Ambler Mining District in Alaska. Huge critical minerals supply for our great state. Highest environmental standards, labor, tribal, uh, individuals I'm going to be meeting with on this uh, Ambler project. The Biden administration, on the day the president held a critical mineral summit, reversed the seven-year environmental impact statement on the Ambler mining road. It's crazy. <laughs> if we got to get off, if we need, you know, green technologies and we need the critical minerals for it, why wouldn't we do it from here? Why would we keep relying on China? The administration recently, um, you know, took a very large critical mineral deposit in Minnesota off, offline for 20 years. All of this does is make us more reliant on China, and they have the worst environmental standards in the world. So would anyone like to comment on this? Like, if we need these technologies and minerals, why wouldn't we get it in the place with the highest standards on the planet? That's America. That's Alaska. Yet this administration talks a big game. And all they do is undertake policies that make us more reliant on the Chinese Communist Party and its economy. Any views on that? And I'll throw it open to anyway. Mr. Boyle, I'll start with you. Well, certainly uh, national security needs to be taken into consideration because if we expose ourselves, we're just moving from one commodity to another. Ms. Harris, any views on that? Just wanting to source critical minerals in the place that has the highest standards in the world, which is us. Yes, of course. Thanks for the question, Senator. Um, you know, thanks to Congress passing the Inflation Reduction Act, the U.S. is now on course to insource much of the battery production while also having minerals sourced from countries that we have trade agreements with. And, and our allies. Yes. Right. And I'll highlight, too, that these rules are being complemented by U.S. programs to reduce, reuse, and recycle the minerals um, from batteries so that we can reduce the need for additional extraction. Good. So you agree with focusing on American production mineral production or our allies who have much higher standards than the Democratic Republic of the Congo and China, correct? Yes, and we're seeing automakers also bring this industry on shore already with over $210 billion of investments just here in the United States to help excellent. with that process. Good, excellent. And um, uh, Mr. Harto, do you, do you have a view on that as well? Uh, I have nothing more to add from, from what's already said. Okay, said. thank Senator, you. if I may, That's just a one, one area point. of bipartisan uh, agreement, I think everybody here agrees with this. It's worth noting, to your point, if we were to convert the entire U.S. trucking fleet to battery electric, we would need to commandeer global production of lithium for more than seven years. Yeah. That's the scale of the problem we're talking about. And it's not that we can't overcome challenges, but we don't overcome them by pretending they don't exist. We just manifest our own density that way. But a lot of the challenges we have, Mr. Chairman, as you know, we can solve here in America with our own high standards on the environment and production. I think it's a good area of bipartisan cooperation. I'm glad all the witnesses uh, are in agreement. Thank you very much. I, I thank the uh, gentleman. And after the Waxman Marquee bill passed, I traveled immediately to China, you know, waiting for it to pass the Senate. And we actually went to a wind turbine manufacturing facility, and it was massive, and we didn't have an equivalent in the United States. And I said, you know, th that w those wind turbines are pointing at our, the American economy in the same way that the Russian missiles were pointing at the United States during the Cuban Missile Crisis. We need a response. And that's what the IRA is. It's saying domestic manufacture, domestic sourcing, only with our allies, uh, and let's just put this thing together because we've been asleep 
you know, uh, allowing for this erosion of our own domestic capacity. So I think it is an area where we can uh, partner. Uh, let, me let me turn to Senator from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate you holding this uh, important and timely hearing today. And uh, I just want to start by saying I'm so proud of the efforts that uh, you've led. Uh, that I've tried to lead, along with Chairman Carper, on pushing the EPA to finalize the strongest possible vehicle emissions rules. Now, uh, I'm starting to like this subcommittee and this committee as a whole because it seems like every time I walk in from another committee, I'm told that uh, they were bashing California again uh, for the audacity to exercise some policy leadership. Uh, so let me just say that uh, you're absolutely right. We're setting the bar high. But we're also thoughtful enough from the governor, the legislature, uh, the congressional delegation on down to be thoughtful about a transition uh, from fossil fuel vehicles to electric. Uh, the deadlines in, that have been set are not tomorrow or next week or next month. We know that there's a transition that needs to take place. And in, by, by setting out a marker several years, we know that technology will continue to improve. Performance of those technologies will continue to improve in that time frame, and not just batteries, but all aspects of an electric vehicle, for example, passenger vehicles uh, to heavy duty trucks, even locomotives eventually, uh, but uh, also uh, modernizing the electrical grid to handle the uh, transition to uh, uh, the transportation sector that we're mindful of. So give us some credit that we're, that we're thoughtful about this and already showing some significant progress. Uh, Focusing on today's hearing, the EPA's latest rules are important for so many reasons. Right? They're going to save drivers money on gas. They're going to create high-quality jobs in the process and continue to position the United, the United States as a leader in zero-emission vehicle technology. Equally important, you know, I want to make sure this is not uh, lost on anybody, equally important to my constituents are the public health protections that come from cleaning up vehicles, particularly in the heavy duty sector. Can't tell you how often I hear from constituents who just wanna be able to breathe clean air outside, go outside to play with their kids and live healthy lives. I hear frequently from constituents all over California, but particularly in the Inland Empire that is, uh, the, the, the nation's capital when it comes to logistics. Uh, now, we all know people love this day and age getting products, whatever they buy online, literally delivered to your doorstep. But we have to understand that that convenience comes with a significant cost to the public health of Californians, not just, but especially in the Inland Empire. So, Mr. Hardo, I appreciate your testimony and your organization's reports that shine a light on the environmental injustices happening in the Inland Empire in California, often referred to, as I said, America's logistics capital. Now, the reports show that the impact of the rapid expansion of warehouses in the area disproportionately fall on low-income communities and communities of color which increases air pollution in the area due to trucks that burn fuel and transport goods to and from our warehouses, to and from ports, and to and from homes. Can you speak for a minute on how EPA's proposed heavy duty rule will mitigate air pollution in these communities? Yeah, thank, thank you for your question. Um, I will admit I have not had a chance to dig too deeply into the EPA's proposal on the heavy duty rules, but we know that decarbonizing and, and removing emissions from these vehicles that are driving around communities in people's front yard, you know, where children are playing in, in communities is extremely important to improving the health of all Americans, especially Americans who live in disadvantaged communities. Right. I think, it, you know, suffice it to say, we've made and can appreciate the significant progress in uh, cleaning up the passenger vehicle sector. We can only imagine the positive benefit that will come with cleaning up the heavy duty uh, vehicle sector as well. One follow-up question in my time remaining, you know, I've been fighting for the cleaner trucks since I first came to the Senate from pushing EPA to originally revise the standards back in 2021 to moving the clean trucks plan uh, to the proposed phase three standards that we're discussing today. 
questions for Ms. Harris. Now, NRDC has written about how the final phase three standards need to aim higher in order to reduce trucking pollution and put the trucking industry on a path to zero emissions. What do you mean by aiming higher? Can you describe what being more ambitious means to you? Sure. Um, EPA's truck standards are, are an important step forward, but the main proposal is much too weak. Um, truck makers have shown that they can deliver less polluting and zero polluting vehicles, and EPA needs standards that will get them to get them on the road. Um, this is especially true given the historic stand in incentives for electric heavy duty vehicles um, that were included in last year's Inflation Reduction Act. And you know, we, to your point, we're gonna be working with our communities, um, or with our partners in communities near highways and ports and freight hubs nationwide to deliver data to the Environmental Protection Agency showing how and why this pollution can be cleaned up and why it must be cleaned up now. Thank you. And in closing, Mr. Chair, I'll just reiterate my invitation to uh, any of our colleagues who want to see the future of a cleaner transportation sector in, in progress. Uh, happy to welcome you to California. Thank you very much. And of course, we always take that as a challenge, um, especially since what they do in California is that they, they take people who are educated at MIT elect them to the United States Senate, then challenge Massachusetts, you know, to develop better, more innovative people. So we, we accept the challenge, as we have in the past. Um, so, um, yeah, so we don't have a choice here. We really don't. I have the great honor as a member of Congress. This is how long I've been around. I voted to bail out Chrysler in 1979. They were going bankrupt because they had fallen so far behind technologically. Then I had the honor in 2009 of voting to bail out Chrysler because they had fallen behind technologically. So we can keep waiting for them to get it and they would keep saying, oh, Tesla, that's, a, that's not the future. You know how hard it is? You know, people don't want to drive around in electric vehicles like a golf cart, you know? They didn't have the vision to see what an electric vehicle could be more powerful than an internal combustion engine vehicle. So now they're hustling to catch up, finally. Thank God, they are. And it's about time because in Europe, for example, the European Parliament has committed to making all new cars and vans in Europe to be zero emission by 2035. So if we want to be selling vehicles in Europe, we better, we better get moving here, okay? It's like, that's, that's the market. And if, if we don't want to be in the market, of course, we can go slow. You know, we could have a bill to bail out auto companies in 2031 because they're going too slow and people aren't buying them. Or in China, we, if we want to have look at Asian markets, we better be making vehicles that they want to purchase. So that just comes down to what Senator Padilla is talking about, that we need to have a way to continue to innovate and get out there. Take them on. We don't want to keep them out. We want to ultimately take them on. Let's have this battle, okay? But we have to have the battle on our terms, you know, so that we're not, we're not Uncle Sucker here just importing all of their raw materials. And, and, and there are different levels of heavy-duty vehicles, and some are easier to electrify, no question about it. A school bus is easier to electrify than a long-haul truck. And that's why EPA rules to regulate different classes of heavy-duty vehicles are different, giving more leeway and a longer ramp to the vehicles that are hardest to electrify. And we can work with the industry on this subject. <coughs> but I will just say this, and I hate to do this before the senator from California leaves, because I'm going to cite the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in California um, for a study which they have completed, that finds that zero emission freight trucks are primed for success because in their assessment, an average long haul trucker goes 150 miles between 30 minute driver breaks. So if we deploy fast charges across this country, um, we can electrify those uh, truck routes and save 13% for the owners of those trucks per mile, if we do it right. Now, we're going to have to do it right, there's no question. And we're gonna to have to do it in the correct sequence, and of course buses and 
other vehicles of that nature are going to be easier than the kind of vehicles that Mr. Boyle's talking about. But we can't do this, you know, reflecting the truck stops that for safety purposes, you know, truck drivers have to uh, accommodate anyway. And it will have to be done in a massive enough future. But again, from Massachusetts, you know, I thank uh, the Senator for all of the great work from the state of California as well. Thank you. Uh, and uh, let, me, um, let me just ask, uh, if I may, one, well, one final question before I turn it over to uh, Senator uh, Rickards. And that would be um, battery efficiency and the uh, efficiency benefits that we get um, uh, for if this EPA supported battery efficiency standards for vehicles as part of the rulemaking process. Could you speak to that? Yeah, I, I can take that question. Thank you. Um, yeah, not, not enough is talked about on efficiency of electric vehicles, uh, increasing the efficiency of EVs reduces the cost, reduces the amount of batteries, and allows the vehicles to travel more, you know, greater distance on the same amount of electricity. Uh, so, you know, ensuring that the EVs that are built are as efficient as possible is, is great for everybody. The EPA is considering the treatment of upstream uh, emissions from plug-in hybrid electrical vehicles and battery electric vehicles. And, I really do believe it's an area where we could put the strongest possible standards in place and the whole system would benefit greatly. Let me turn and recognize Senator Ricketts. One Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, um, Ms. Uh, Ms. Harris, Mr. Harlow, both of you mentioned that when it comes to securing these critical minerals that we can work with our allies and certainly Canada is obviously a very close ally. I think you mentioned Chile too. Was, a third, was Argentina the third one that you mentioned? Australia. Australia, okay, very good. When it comes to specific items, right, when you have to make a battery, you can't miss anything or else the battery's not gonna work. Is that a fair statement? Like if you don't have graphite, you can't make the battery work, is that fair? Sure. Okay, so I think 80% of the graphite comes from China. Can these other countries make up the difference of that? I mean, is, has somebody done, again, for all the critical minerals, that are needed for these batteries. Has somebody looked at the reserves for these countries and done the math to see that they can actually meet that need? I mean, we've heard that you're gonna to have to, I think Mr. Boyle, you said 35% of the world's uh, minerals we're gonna to need to do all the heavy trucks, right? We need the common seven years worth of global seven year, production. Seven years worth, sorry. Yeah. Has anybody done that math? Like looked at the allies and what they can actually provide? I believe that there are some studies on that, but I have not, I don't have that in front of me. So you don't have any personal knowledge of it, Mr. Harder, do you? Uh, yeah, again, we, we haven't dug deep into it, uh, but I will say that you mentioned graphite. Uh, there, there's methods to make synthetic graphite from coal. Uh, we have a lot of coal that's not gonna be used uh, here in the United States. So, so do you know how much more expensive that would be to make it from? I, I don't know offhand. Okay. Um, and then, Ms. Harris, I think in your testimony, you said, in your written testimony, rather, you said rural drivers who on average tend to drive further and have larger vehicles stand to benefit the most from identifying their electric vehicles. Is that accurate? Yes. I believe that the study you were looking at analyzes impacts in Maine, Vermont, Virginia, Maryland, and Maryland. Is that accurate? I believe so, yes. So just out of curiosity, do you know how long it takes to drive north to south um, in Maryland? I don't have that, that estimate in front about of me. About four hours. Yeah. What about uh, Vermont? Have you any idea? I would say, I would estimate maybe two to three hours. Actually, it's about four hours and 40 minutes, so it's a little bit uh, longer in Vermont. Nebraska is about seven hours. And if you look at not just how long it takes to drive back and forth, but also just like the square mileage, um, if you look at the states that you were citing in your study, uh, Maryland's about a sixth the size of Nebraska, Vermont's an eighth the size. Maryland's, uh, Maine rather is about half the size, a little bit less, and Virginia's a little bit more than half of it. So my point being that these states are not typical for what you'd find in the Western United States as far as rural states. And so that they, uh, trying to get at how it's going to impact people in those states is one of the challenges. In fact, that's one of the things I've noticed since I've come here to Washington, D.C. And again, to Senator Carper's point, driving electric vehicles, they are fun. They got great acceleration. And it's great that we can uh, you know, have fun with them like that. But I think one of the <coughs> things I've seen here in Washington, D.C. in my short time 
is that when you are around big urban areas, you have a different perspective on how you can use electric vehicles and the access to charging stations and so forth versus a rural state like Nebraska where you've got too much pollen areas that wouldn't even be considered big on the East Coast and a lot of open space in between where you don't have a lot of people. We've got, you know, for example, three times as many, um, actually four times, no, three times, three times as many cows as we have people. So you have to drive long distances to be able to get anywhere. And I mentioned the stretch between Allen and Hay Springs, 340 miles, there's no charging stations. The, even with the $6 million a year, I think Nebraska is going to be getting from the uh, stimulus package that got passed, you're not going to be able to build that out in time to be able to have two thirds of the vet, my humble opinion, by 2032. That's a lot of infrastructure. We're challenging with that right now uh, when it comes to just getting broadband out to our Nebraska households. That's a billion dollar investment there to be able to get just broadband to every household in Nebraska. Trying to do charging stations is going to be another draw. And then again, just my experience as governor, working with our public power districts, we're the only public power state in the country, uh, just providing, for example, Google and Facebook, which use a lot of electricity, have come to our state and we, you know, economic development, creating jobs, they use a lot of electricity. And you just don't you know, pop up the kind of electricity it takes to handle those types of facilities. In fact, in my conversations with uh, OPPD, um, Javier Fernandez is our president, uh, you know, it's a challenge to be able to make sure you can keep up with just the growing needs that we have today. None of this is factored into that, right? None of this is factored into having two thirds of cars be electric vehicles in less than 10 years. It's not in their plans right now to be able to accommodate that sort of growth in uh, the utility field. So. My time has expired, so I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the Senator. The Senator from West Virginia is recognized. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I, this is a quick in and out, but this is a very topical uh, uh, topic, and I appreciate the, the three of you and the panel being here today. So I'm going to jump right in with Mr. Boyle. Uh, I understand that your fleet uh, transports sensitive materials that can have strict uh, temperature range requirements. You did a lot of uh, transporting, I believe, of the vaccine. Yes, ma'am. Yes. If you're required to purchase an electric heavy-duty truck, do you have any concerns about the ability to deliver shipments with these kind of specific temperatures? And what are those even available with that kind of uh, technology uh, for, for a heavy-duty, uh, electric heavy-duty truck? That's, that's a great point. So the draw and the demand is very intense. It is a completely different dynamic than the auto sector. And I would like to address and, uh, Chairman Markey and Senator Padilla explicitly, we share your concern in your drive toward zero emissions. The trucking industry starts at yes. We are on that path. And we share the concern about all different communities, rural and urban. But the path to get there has to be logical. right? We can't be set up for failure. And in many respects, some of the regulations have caused negative consequences. California actually has among the oldest truck fleets in the country. So 52% of California trucks are pre-2010 diesel emissions. If we got them current to today, that would be an 83% reduction with the existing infrastructure. So it's not that we do not want to reduce emissions. We're fully on board with that. It's just that not all solutions, we can't spread the peanut butter from cars onto all vehicles. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this, and it's probably been asked, the cost issue uh, for your new a new diesel truck in your business, how does that cost, uh, uh, what's the equivalence there for that and a uh, electric uh, uh, truck? So the upcharge is roughly $300,000. And it's true that- That's uh, on top of what the, the vehicle costs? Yes, ma'am. The upcharge, the delta. And it now, as my uh, friends to, to the right of me here have pointed out, over the co cost of ownership, that may a portion of that may be realized, but not nearly the three hundred thousand dollars. But at some point, yeah, it might be somewhat more viable. It's just that we are years away from it, and it's simply not an option because there aren't there isn't the infrastructure or power to get to them. Okay, so in terms of let's say if we're looking ten years down the road, or if we look ten years back, would that three hundred thousand? Uh, we expect, I think, and, and you probably, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Do you expect, I expect, that that delta goes down uh, over time as there's more 
or not. So the economies of scale that have been uh, discussed previously in the auto sector where the market, the addressable market is exponentially larger in the millions of vehicles per mm -hmm. year. In trucks, it's uh, you know a couple hundred thousand. So the market opportunity isn't such that you would have a Moore's law for heavy trucks, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so I can tell you over the course of my career, I haven't seen truck prices go down much over time. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, so, but yes, could it be compelling in a total cost of ownership at some point, perhaps? And we're not averse to that, but we're certainly not in position to even phase that in, in at a 1% level at current. And the weight is an issue as well, uh, both for cars and for, I'm concerned yes. about, uh, I know, uh, I'll go to cars. Cars are more, are, are going to be heavier. EV cars are going to be heavier because the, of the weight of the battery and other things. Uh, you know, what kind of safety issues are, uh, and what kind of, you know, state DOTs, what kind of reinforcements along the highways, and, uh, you know, is that all going to change? Accidents, impacts, all of these things I know are are critical when you're looking at, you know, transforming an entire fleet. And I, sure. I don't know if in the trucking industry, by the time you add the weight to the truck, what does that do to the cargo? Because there are weight limits, obviously. Sure. Yeah. So we have so each truck, heavy duty truck, uh, electric vehicle battery would be about eight thousand pounds, and they're mm -hmm. typically in sets of two, three, or four. Mm -hmm. So as you add weight in that respect, you reduce yeah. the payload capacity. Right. right. Um, and I think another lever for improving congestion and emissions that you've championed, you know, with direct targeted infrastructure investment, and particularly uh, in choke points around the country in a smart fashion, then reducing traffic reduces emissions, right? That's right. another level that we, lever that the government has at its disposal. Yeah. Um, Ms. Harris, I wanted to ask you a question on uh, your, in your testimony, you highlight the NRDC support for EVs and the incentives in the Inflation Reduction Act. Well, the, va the investments for, uh, that have to be made in uh, battery manufacturing we, we know we're beholden to China right now, so we're trying to draw that back into this our own country and have domestically produced critical minerals and uh, and chips and everything. Does the NRDC, I mean, are, are you supporting any uh, domestic mining projects right now that would provide that? Can you name any that, you're, that your organization does support in terms of uh, creating a mine for uh, critical memory, minerals? That, that is not my area of expertise, um, but I will say that the auto industry is already an, uh, has already committed over $210 billion to bringing this battery supply chain here to the United States, and many of the incentives that are coming from, from Congress, including in the Inflation Reduction Act, are not only helping to onshore some of these supply chains, but are also incentivizing reducing, reusing, and recycling the batteries so that we need to extract less minerals moving well, forward. But we still have to d extract, I mean, in order to get the domestic uh, production requirements in the Inflation Reduction Act and other things. We still, there is, uh, are requirements for, uh, and there is a, a great desire for us to have domestic uh, uh, materials, whether they're recycled or not, you've got to originate if you're going to have this whole huge glut of new, new uh, vehicles or trucks or whatever, or both. You have to have the critical mineral, and you have to have the mind to do it. So we have to have support for permitting reform and for permitting these mines. And, um, uh, you know, I question whether your organization would be in favor, and I understand it's not your expertise, of domestic mining of some of these critical min minerals, which can be very difficult. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Great. Thank you. Um, and just a tip of the cap to West Virginia, because school buses are considered to be heavy duty. And they're making them. And they're making them in West Virginia. So the innovation state of West Virginia has figured out how to make heavy duty, you know, buses, school buses that will be purchased in states, you know, all over the country. And... Uh, they've already made an announcement in West Virginia of 750 jobs in a battery manufacturing plant that's um, going to be uh, opening down in West Virginia. And uh, congratulations on that and the fact that it's a company from Somerville, Massachusetts, which is going to use West Virginia for the 750 manufacturing jobs down there. That form, form energy, F-O-R-M. Yeah. 
that's going to the grid. Uh, but uh, again, it's this larger size, you know, battery technology that can be developed. So, for example, I heard Mr. Boyle talking about how when the truck fills up, it goes 1,200 miles. But if you take out that 1,200 mile capacity for oil, that leaves a lot of space for a battery uh, and innovation that can develop that battery that could fill in because that's a lot of weight that's taken off the truck. Uh, if you could then replace it with a battery that could use it. So West Virginia is at the cutting edge uh, on those issues. Um, and again, I, I view this, um, Mr. Boyle, in a, in a way in which, you know, we had these cell phones that were the size of a brick, and then I know because I moved over the 200 megahertz to create the flip phone era, and if you listen to the incumbents at that time, oh my God, you don't know how hard that is. But within three years, everyone had a flip phone by 1995. And then a very smart kid out in Silicon Valley figured out, oh, you know what, with all that spectrum, I could actually turn it into an iPhone with the capacity of a, um, of a computer on the Apollo mission in 1969. So I'm very confident that once we set these high goals with all of the tax incentives that are going to be there, uh, that we'll make the breakthroughs. But understanding that you are in an area which will be more difficult, but there are many other heavy-duty truck areas that you know can be solved. Do you do you agree with that? That that so you that, that for school buses for other types of heavy-duty, but still you know within a range of technological feasibility to solve that problem in a relatively short period of time. You make a great point, sir. So the it is a massive, diverse industry, and it's not uh, not all operations are the same. However, your, your previous statement where you used a, a very important term, sequence, it has to be at the right sequence. Currently, 0.001% of operations could be supported. So we... the. And that's part of the pr problem is the clean trucks rule, all these things are way too aggressive based on the current infrastructure. And we have made, many carriers are actually making increase in the, when the utility tells you you're three years out from converting to 10 forklifts in a warehouse, that just, it, I think that should alert us to the fact that we're just not there. And once again, we're on board with getting there in a gradual fashion, but even come January of this year, we're not, we're not quite there, but we, we, we welcome the opportunity to kind of inform the rulemaking in legislative process. Yeah, and, uh, and I thank you for that. Again, the, 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 sequ the, the sequencing is important, uh, but we should get those heavy duty vehicles that we can and then continue to work knowing that innovation will help us to accommodate the more difficult uh, areas over time, but still to meet the goal. Um, and one thing, Mr. Haro, that continues to tick me off is that we import oil from Saudi Arabia, that we import oil from Iraq to put into gasoline tanks in the United States. You know, we put 70% of all the oil we consume into gasoline tanks, when with innovation, we can just back out that oil. So can you talk about those benefits, Mr. Haro, for our society, both from a climate and from a national security perspective? Uh well, I can talk talk about it from the perspective of the consumer, and uh, you know, from from the consumer perspective, uh, not having to worry about the fluctuations in the price of gas as it as it goes from two dollars a gallon to five dollars a gallon, back to <coughs> three dollars and fifty cents a gallon, and who knows where it goes tomorrow or two weeks from now. Um, and and electrified vehicles, whether. Uh, their hybrids, whether they're plug-in hybrids, which would work great in Senator Ricketts state of Nebraska, where people may have to drive long distances uh, without charging infrastructure uh, while still significantly reducing emissions. Uh, all of those technologies can uh, reduce consumers' uh, you know, risk uh, to, to fluctuating oil prices. Yeah, with, without question, you know, when when uh, Saudi Arabia and OPEC Plus, like two weeks ago, decided, oh, too much oil on the market, we're just going to reduce the amount of oil on the market to drive the price back up again. Well, you know, the equivalent of my father, the truck driver, he can't do anything about it. He's got to buy the oil. He doesn't have a choice. And we, we, we're just held, you know, to whatever the price that this cocktail, this essential monopoly, you know, a cocktail, you know, wants to charge us. So this gives us a chance to kind of break that link and it'll probably help us make more 
intelligent foreign policy decisions as well in terms of, uh, in terms of this dependence that we've had upon oil over all of the years. So, um, so I can't thank all of you enough for, um, for your uh, testimony today. And in conclusion, what I'm going to give you each is one minute to summarize what you want us to know at the conclusion of this hearing. And I'll go in reverse order of the opening statements and give each one of you that one minute. We'll begin with you, Mr. Boyle. The trucking industry is not averse to change. We embrace the opportunity to explore alternative fuels, alternative technologies to, to achieve zero emissions over time. Uh, we're very disappointed with EPA's about face in terms of the existing rulemaking that manufacturers were trending to and planning for and investing the capital necessary to achieve another significant reduction in emissions. And then secondly, the, uh, this kind of <coughs> punting to a state patchwork of emission standards is not workable when you're dealing in interstate commerce. Um, and the assumptions and the passion for uh, electric vehicles in the car industry, in the car segment, I totally appreciate. But to extrapolate that onto the trucking industry into the complexities where you can't leverage any of the existing car charging infrastructure is a huge mistake. And we look forward to working constructively both with Congress and the agencies. I thank, thank you. I thank you so much. And again, I, I, I should have offered Senator Ricketts a, a final round as well, which I did not do, and I apologize for that. And if you would like to ask questions, let me just give these each one of these to one minute, and then we'll come back to you. Ms. Harris? Thank you so much. Um, I would want to take away kind of three major wins that a transition to One minute. Oh, yes. No, I will sum it up very quickly. Okay, good. But the three wins that we can anticipate through a transition to cleaner cars is, you know, a win for pollution reductions and for public health. Um, clean car standards will reduce greenhouse gas emissions and also just improve the health of our communities and our children. It's a win for consumer pocketbooks and for consumer choice. We know that transitioning to zero emission vehicles can save drivers thousands and thousands of dollars over the life cycle of the vehicle. And it's a win for investment for the industry and the economy in the United States. We're gonna, we have the opportunity to have a renaissance of manufacturing here in the US and incorporate and increase our comp competitiveness across the globe. And so for these reasons, we're very excited and appreciate the federal government's efforts to support this transition. Thank you, Ms. Harris, very Thank much. You. And Mr. Harto. Yeah, and I just want to reiterate my three main points that these EPA standards are achievable. Uh, that there is consumer demand that is far outpacing supply for electric vehicles, and we see that continuing into the future. Uh, and third, that again, EVs already save consumers money, and they will continue to save consumers money far into the future. Uh, thank so. you, Mr. Harto, very much. And again, I apologize to Senator Ricketts, and we recognize for another round of questions. Not at all. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So, Mr. Harto, you mentioned earlier, uh, you talked about hybrids. And I actually agree with you that a hybrid is a better solution with regard to the, like, states like Nebraska, where you have bigger um, you know, distances, you get longer distances rather than you have to drive. The EPA has said to attain their standards by 2032, it'd have to be something like two-thirds of cars would have to be electric vehicles if it was only an electric vehicle solution. But you also mentioned in your earlier testimony that car manufacturers could do things like hybrids, correct? That's correct. Do you know, have you done the math, have you seen any studies that show that, say, you were going to just assume electric vehicles were going to grow at, say, the current pace, what would uh, hybrid vehicles have to be, what percentage of the new car sales would hybrid vehicles have to be to meet the same sort of attainment standards uh, if you had two thirds, you know, again? Yeah, I, again, we're, uh, gonna, we're gonna have a mix of solutions in different places. Uh, when we did the an analysis on a 50% on a uh, target, if an automaker built mostly hybrids, that 50% that drops down to about 35% uh, uh, electric vehicles. So again, an automaker could build 50%. You know, again, I don't know the exact numbers, but uh, they can build a mix. And the more hybrids they build, the more plug-in hybrids they build, the fewer battery electric vehicles they have to build. So you said that, but, but your but Consumer Reports has done the math on that to say how much uh, percentage would be, we, what we, the mix would have to be uh, to reach these attainment emission standards? 
we, we haven't, for the, for the current rules, we plan to do some of that analysis in the future. Uh, they were just released last week, so we haven't had a chance to run the numbers. Right. Uh, but, but we have done it on similarly strong standards, um, and there's a lot of room to, uh, you know, apply other technologies. Yeah, okay. Uh, Mr. Boyle, we, we've talked a lot about how the trucking industry is on board with reducing emissions. You've already been doing it. Talk to me a little bit, though, about, you mentioned uh, the patchwork of states, but you also trying to do this. Can you discuss the impact these rules would have on business development strategy? I mean, what, you know, when you have a change like this, what does it do for your long-term business planning? Yeah, and I think, I, I hope I conveyed early on how my company is in the top 1% of the top 1% in terms of sustainability, performance, and initiatives. I can tell you that tragically, it is not valued in the marketplace. So one other lever that I would suggest that the federal government has at its disposal is to put out a carrot. So think of the purchasing power of the US Postal Service, the GSA, the Department of Defense. None of those factor in sustainability of the transportation service provider in the procurement decision. So how about we use market forces to entice people to buy newer, cleaner vehicles and that will enable us to, to bring that 40% of America's fleet that's on the old standard up to current. And that will have, without as much of an investment, that will have a greater impact. Mm -hmm. uh, what about, though, the, again, just on your own business planning, when you see changes like this, how does that impact your business specifically? Yeah, I, I guess it, we, we'd have to have a lot more trucks to service the same amount of freight. And then we'd have to, uh, you know, we, we really, as of right now, it's not even a consideration to invest in battery electric trucks. And the clean truck fleet rule uh, is not saying, as Senator Markey said, hey, particular applications is more applicable. No, you're looking at, hey, every motor carrier, you have to have this percentage. And that's just co completely irrational. So you're saying the regulations don't accommodate kind of what we're talking about, that maybe school buses would be a good application, but long haul trucks would not be. It, the regulation's too broad. It's too blunt of an instrument to actually make that sort. It doesn't have that nuance, is that Th fair? That's, that's a great analogy, yes, because all school buses have the same uh, kind of characteristics in operation. Trucking is so massively diverse. Now, I thought you just said something, though, about it's a discouragement to make investments in battery trucks. Yes, is that what you just so, said? well, right now, because, as we said, the sequence, the, the power generation, if we, if we said right now 25 new nuclear plants are going in to create clean energy in the country to feed the grid and other renewables, and then we're going to build, the, in parallel, the charging infrastructure, hey, then we're considering it. That's a business decision. We all want to reduce fuel consumption. That's good business. But without those in place, there's actually no consideration whatsoever. All right, well, thank you, Mr. Boyle. Thank you. And uh, Chairman Markey, I would note that under the last administration, the United States was energy independent before the Biden administration's policies that reduced the investment by our own uh, companies here in America. So we weren't actually, didn't have to do all that in, uh, importation of other fuel if we take advantage of our own resources. Well, no, we were importing oil from saying, Saudi Arabia and from uh, other OPEC countries. But we were a net exporter of energy. So we, we, and we could be again if we would take advantage of some of the things we talked about today about using our resources. And of course, I don't think anybody's gonna do it better than we are with regard to protecting the environment. I, I appreciate what you're saying, but if we did not export our own oil, we could have uh, told Saudi Arabia and other countries, we don't need your oil at all. So by exporting our own oil, we then need Saudi oil. And in essence, what this revolution is, we're saying to all of the oil companies, we're not gonna need your oil. Okay, we're going all electric. It's not gonna be, um, drill baby drill it's going to be plug in baby plug in so so it's across the whole oil industry across domestic and international markets but i you know i appreciate um what you're saying um and ultimately this plan is one to create jobs in america let's just say that okay if if by the time uh we have 50 percent of all vehicles here sold in the united states by 2030 are electric and we do nothing to onshore the EV supply chain or grow the market share for American-made vehicles, there will be significant job losses in the United States. But if 50% of vehicles sold in the US in 2030 are electric and we increase domestic content and increase the market share of American-made cars, more than 140,000 new jobs will be created in the United States. So implementation of this uh, matters. 
And uh, it's going to be very important for us uh, to make sure that we get this technological and economic and climate justice revolution, you know, underway, uh, and that it happens in a fair way with environmental justice uh, for our communities, uh, for our union workers, and with intentional implementation of the billions of dollars in new um, uh, uh, in new money going to the right places, while the EPA has to deliver uh, that we are in fact. Um, uh, delivering for those communities that have uh, always been uh, impacted most uh, uh, most intensively, and uh, uh, and and again, I'll just add one more fact that in 2022, the United States was a net petroleum exporter. In 2022, so uh, we were in fact more importing, exporting more oil than we actually imported in 2022. So, and that's just, you know, the reality of where we are today. And this is a discussion about are we moving to the future? So as a matter of housekeeping, um, uh, I would like to ask unanimous consent to submit for the record a variety of materials that include letters from stakeholders and other materials that relate to today's nomination hearing. Uh, and uh, uh, without objection, uh, so ordered, senators will be allowed to submit written questions for the record through the close of business on May 2nd. We will compile these questions, send them to all of our witnesses, who we will then ask to reply by May 16. Uh, and with that, uh, this, I think, very important in a formative hearing is adjourned. Thank you.